Hi, everyone, and thank you for attending today's webinar, Breaking New Frontiers in Robotics and Edge Computing with AI. Before we begin, we wanted to cover a couple of housekeeping items. Dustin has created a wonderful presentation for us today. The content is pre-recorded, which allows Dustin to be online to answer questions in real time via the Q&A widget throughout the event. At the bottom of your screen are multiple application widgets. All of the widgets, as well as the slide area, are resizable and movable, so feel free to move them around to get the most out of your desktop space. If you have any questions during the webcast, please submit them through the Q&A widget. We'll try to cover as many questions as possible during the live Q&A portion, but if there's any we don't get to, we'll post them on the forum to keep the conversations going. Be sure to check out the resource list for links to the developer site, forums, wiki, and more. If you run into any technical issues during the, web, the webcast, you can find answers to some common issues located in the help widget at the bottom of your screen. An on-demand version of the webcast will be available approximately one day after and can be accessed using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier. And with that, let's get started. Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us today for the latest episode from our Jetson webinar series, Breaking New Frontiers in Robotics and Edge Computing with AI. I'm Dustin, an embedded developer with the Jetson team at NVIDIA. Today, we'll highlight the latest advances in AI and robotics and discuss how anyone can get started deploying their own AI into the field with edge computing. First, here's the agenda of today's session. We're going to recap recent results and breakthroughs introduce the new Jetpack 3.1 software release from NVIDIA, and cover the latest performance improvements for Jetson. Then we'll dive into how anyone can build and deploy complex AI systems, ending up with what's on the horizon and where we're headed in the future. With AI playing an increasing role in solving many real-world challenges of today, amazing progress has been made in several areas like image classification, speech recognition, motion control, and self-driving cars. The disruption which triggered this great leap forward is deep learning. What distinguishes it from previous neural network-based approaches in machine learning is it enables you to train very large networks over very large data sets, resulting in vastly increased intelligence and much more accurate performance than was previously possible. In recent years, the field's undergone a renaissance with no shortage of breakthrough results, like when learning-based AlphaGo first beat a professional Go player last year and came back this year in late May to defeat the world champion. Last year, it was trained with supervised deep learning based on historical games played by experts, and this year, before winning the title, it added reinforcement learning to play against itself and further improve its performance, which we'll talk more about later. Also earlier this year, the TensorCart project was released to much fanfare in the open source community. As opposed to driving around the track based on imperial physics data from the game engine, TensorCart only received the raw pixels from the screen and output the N64 controls directly like a real driver would. Trained in the style of its human operator, TensorCart was using a supervised end-to-end -end network called DriveNet that NVIDIA developed and published for use in self-driving cars. Robots are also learning to stand up and walk, pick, grasp, and assemble objects, and fly around complex environments without crashing into anything. This spring at GTC, NVIDIA presented our self-flying drone that uses deep neural nets for path following, obstacle detection, and collision avoidance. It requires no GPS and flies fully autonomously based on visual input from its single forward-facing camera. Everywhere, scientists and developers are using AI to bring new and exciting capabilities to their platforms, and as it turns out, many of them are powered underneath by NVIDIA. With neither neural networks or GPUs being new inventions, why the sudden breakthroughs? It wasn't until 2012 when researchers applied GPU computing, or GPGPU, to learning and scaled up the size of the networks and data sets, coining the term deep learning, that the true potential of AI was unlocked. But the performance alone isn't the only advantage to deep learning. It's a fundamentally different paradigm where the same network architecture can be retasked or retrained to do a great many things without needing to rewrite software. In the past, you would have a computer vision PhD spend months hand-tuning algorithms to, say, detect a person in video. In the new model of deep learning, during the first phase, you simply train the neural network with many instances of the data that you wanted to learn about, whatever that is. 
The same network that detects people can easily be made to detect cars, man-made, or natural objects, whatever is contained within the training data. In supervised learning, you tell the network what it is in the training data by labeling it. You show it a person and say that's a person. You show it a car and say that's a car, or that's a red sedan. And through this process, it learns how to distinguish background from the people from a car that happens to be a red sedan. The result of training is a model snapshot that can be deployed for the second phase of deep learning, which is called inference. During inference, you show it new data that it hasn't seen before, and the neural network makes educated guesses based on its prior trainings about that data. Inferencing is a lot faster than training and can even be embedded into platforms deployed in the field. Due to the size of the data sets, typically training happens in workstations or clusters with access to GPU cards like NVIDIA's Titan X or Tesla P40, or even our DGX1 supercomputer for the fastest training. Like training, you can also perform inferencing of the data center for your digital assistants, image search, web apps, or other web services where connectivity and latency are not a major concern. But there are some embedded use cases like cars, robots, and UAVs where mission-critical inferencing is best suited on board or at the edge. Why is AI at the edge so important? It's simple. For systems in the field, there are many use cases where you simply cannot rely on a round trip through the cloud to solve the problem. For some problems like AI cities, the scale is so big and the amount of data is generated so vast that the network cannot possibly support it. For robotics, you have devices that support safety critical services and need to make millisecond decisions at the speed of light. For many companies, data security is of paramount importance to protect the privacy of individuals and keep intellectual property safe. And for many applications in remote areas where robots and UAVs are ideally suited, Network coverage is spotty or just doesn't exist, or it's slower with the degraded speeds of 2G or satellite communications. Relying on the cloud may not be an option when the connection isn't always available. If you want to solve these problems with AI, you must have decision-making AI at the edge. That's at the camera, on the robot, in the drone. But the, in the past, there was never a platform that could do this. How do you get the kind of supercomputing performance you need to do inferencing on large and deep neural networks in the power envelope and size constraints at the edge? Enter NVIDIA's Jetson Embedded Computing Platform. Jetson's are a line of low-power embedded supercomputer on modules for deploying AI to the edge. What sets Jetson apart from other embedded solutions is its integrated NVIDIA GPU compatible with the rest of the NVIDIA software stack and CUDA. Jetson's compute performance and power efficiency is unparalleled in a sub-10 watt module small enough that you can hold it in the palm of your hand. This past spring, we launched Jetson TX2, our latest and greatest module with a hex core 64-bit ARM CPU, integrated NVIDIA Pascal GPU, and 8 gigabytes of LPDR4 memory. With over a teraflop and a half of performance and 7.5 watts of typical power usage, TX2 is the highest performing edge computing solution available in the market today. It's like having a high-end server that you can deploy into the field. And unlike typical servers, it's also equipped with several dedicated media streaming engines such as H.264, H.265 codecs capable of encoding or decoding multiple 4K streams simultaneously, in addition to six MIPI CSI camera ports and high-speed PCIe lanes and USB 3 buses. The module is obtained through distributors worldwide, including Arrow in North America and Silicon Highway in Europe. Here's an overview of the key hardware differences between Jetson TX2 and its predecessor from late 2015, Jetson TX1. Keep in mind that at one teraflop, TX1 is still very much capable in its own right, and like TX2, will be available through the mid-2020s. Jetson TX2 is designed as a drop-in replacement for TX1, and it's thermally, electrically, and mechanically backwards compatible. TX2 is based on the NVIDIA Pascal GPU architecture, whereas TX1 is based on Maxwell. TX2 has a hex core CPU complex comprised of a quad core ARM A57 in addition to NVIDIA's own Denver 2 CPU, whereas the TX1 just has the quad core A57. TX1 has 4 GB of RAM and 16 GB of eMMC, whereas TX2 has 8 GB of RAM and 32 GB of MMC. They both have Wi Fi and Bluetooth. TX1 can do 4K P30 encode whereas TX2 can do 4K P60 encode. Uh, otherwise, they have the same uh, form factor and pin-to-pin -pin compatible board connector.
With Jetson TX2, NVIDIA introduced the notion of Max-Q and Max-P energy profiles for maximum efficiency and runtime performance, respectively. Using dynamic frequency scaling and other optimizations, Jetson is able to adapt its performance to the user's workload at runtime. Max-Q mode delivers the ultimate power efficiency for under 7.5 watts. Max-Q is defined as the maximum inflection point on the TX2's performance per watt curve, or the highest amount of performance that yields the best efficiency. Max-P mode is geared for peak performance. It consumes less than 15 watts while producing twice the throughput of TX1. Together, these modes produce a mix of the best conditions that meet a wide swath of applications. However, Jetson developers can also create their own profiles and tailor the performance of Jetson by individual tweaking clocks and other settings, which are very granular on the platform, such as individual clocks for the ARM CPU, GPU, memory controller, and I.O. endpoints, and being able to turn on, off, and park individual CPU cores, for example. To easily get started developing embedded AI systems with Jetson, NVIDIA has the Jetson Developer Kit available, which is an open source mini ITX reference design that includes all the design collateral online, such as the schematics, data sheets, and layout guides necessary to create your own deployable solutions. The Developer Kit Carrier Board breaks out most functions of the module, such as desktop PCI Express, HDMI, USB 3, and Gigabit Ethernet. Intended for use mostly during the R&D phase, the dev kit comes pre-assembled with the TX2 module itself and an onboard MIPI CSI camera module, also open sourced and based on the OmniVision OV5693 sensor. The dev kit can be obtained through e-tailers online or the NVIDIA.com web store, and also there's a half-off academic discount available. Stemming from the dev kit design materials openly available online, grew an ecosystem of third-party components and accessories geared towards developers, including miniature carriers, compact sub-assemblies, enclosures, peripherals, and cameras, all compatible with Jetson. Everything you already need is here to go from prototyping to production. Folks have quickly built drones and other embedded platforms with these off-the-shelf components. There's also software partners available specializing in AI and multimedia. NVIDIA keeps a full listing of the Jetson ecosystem online through our developer portal located at developer.nvidia.com slash embedded. Jetpack is our embedded SDK for intelligent machines and devices. It includes the Linux for Tegra BSP that runs the Jetson's OS, Ubuntu, in addition to all the NVIDIA drivers, CUDA toolkit, deep learning and computer vision libraries, and the multimedia tools and samples. It's compatible with a larger NVIDIA software platform. Supporting GPU applications is largely unnecessary. We release a new Jetpack software update for Jetson every few months that includes the latest tools, performance enhancements, and bug fixes. Today, we're previewing the upcoming Jetpack 3.1 release, which will be available to developers shortly online and is a milestone production release shared between both Jetson TX1 and TX2. Jetpack 3.1 contains the full complement of software and design collateral to take TX2 into production, matured from the early developer preview of TX2 with the Jetpack 3.0 release. In addition, Jetpack 3.1 includes upgrades to QDNN version 6 and TensorRT 2.1. With this, there's a 2x performance boost for low latency single image inferencing and support for the latest networks in TensorRT. Advanced features were added to the camera stack, and NVIDIA supports OpenCV with upstream contributions and integrated camera capture support for the onboard CSI camera. You'll be able to download the Jetpack 3.1 update from the URL shown here. Jetpack is run from a host machine to reflash the TX1 or TX2 in recovery mode. You connect it to the host over micro USB and Ethernet, and after it's flashed with Jetpack, you can run the Jetson like an ordinary PC, or you can still cross-compile from the host to the target like a traditional embedded environment. Let's take a look at the latest performance figures taken from Jetpack 3.1. Provided are measurements of the GoogleNet and ResNet 50 image recognition networks, which are generally regarded as providing high-quality classification and being computationally demanding, especially for an embedded platform. With Jetpack 3.1, Jetson TX2 gets up to 80 frames per second with ResNet and 180 frames per second with GoogleNet when processing a single image at a time or batch size 1. Jetson can actually achieve much higher throughput with batch sizes up to 128 thanks to its 8 gigabytes of main memory. But as we'll see, the downside of the higher batch sizes is increased latency as you accumulate the necessary frames for processing. 
Like previously mentioned, TensorRT2 doubles the performance of single batch inferencing as compared to the previous version, TensorRT1. Single batches are often used by real-time constrained applications that need access to inferencing results as soon as possible with minimal latency. With Jetpack 3.1, the latency of GoogleNet is down to 7 milliseconds in max Q mode and 5.5 milliseconds in max P mode. This allows Jetson to be deployed in situations that demand quasi-real-time performance and ultimately to enable their platforms with improved perception and reaction capabilities driven by inferencing. Look out for upcoming posts on NVIDIA's Parallel for All blog, Jetpack 3.1 doubles Jetson's low latency inference performance for more discussion of TensorRT2. With the inclusion of the optimizations for low latency inferencing, which are backwards compatible with the previous API and transparent to the user, the deep learning performance of both Jetson TX1 and TX2 is faster than ever with a simple drop-in update. Some of you remember this isn't the first time we've doubled our own performance. In fact, we like to do this a couple times per year with the release of software improvements in Jetpack or the launch of a new Jetson. With twice the single batch inferencing performance and half the latency as before, platforms using Jetson with Jetpack 3.1 are able to meet demanding real-time requirements and respond to events more quickly in the field. Typically, platforms that are undergoing motion or have cyber-physical aspects, like those with electronically controlled servos and actuators, aim to achieve the best response times. This includes vision-aided systems where the sensors are connected to mechanical outputs in the real world. On moving platforms where processing can be the bottleneck, they may only be able to travel as fast as they can process sensor data. So bringing TX2 on board with a teraflop and a half of compute can be a game changer in terms of responsiveness and what's possible for these platforms. With double the low latency inferencing throughput, TensorRT addresses a key focus for autonomous vehicles that use deep learning to operate safely in their environments. Before a delivery drone can deliver a package from point A to point B, or before an inspection drone can get up close to inspect, the sense and avoid capabilities must be in place first, and the latency requirements for these are very low since their output is required to be continuously reliable and persistent since a collision could in theory occur at any time. We assume nothing about the environment and using AI base our actions on the incoming situational awareness in real time. Platforms without AI often rely on human operators with prior knowledge to establish valid operating conditions in the environment, essentially guaranteeing that the platforms won't run into anything. To gain true autonomy, they need edge computing to process the data at the source, and with Jetpack 3.1, the latency in between the time when events occur and decisions are made is minimal. In addition to its noted runtime performance improvements, TensorRT2 also adds a custom layer API and support for advanced networks like recurrent neural nets, or RNNs, and LSTMs, long short-term memory networks, both of which can encode memory storage within themselves and exhibit recall capabilities, which are particularly useful while processing time series data or if you need your robot to remember certain sequences of events or make decisions. Via the custom layers, additional object detection frameworks like Faster RCNN and YOLO are now supported by the tool too. TensorRT supports many of the latest network architectures while delivering the best performance available on GPU platforms. Shown on the right is the signature of a typical user plugin to TensorRT. The user implements their custom process in CUDA kernel inside the NQ function. TensorRT then calls the plugin at the appropriate time in the pipeline, which allows the custom layers to exist within TensorRT's graph optimizations. To provide the best performance for deploying production networks into the field, TensorRT accelerates DNN inferencing by performing a host of optimizations to create an efficient execution engine used at runtime. TensorRT will fuse multiple network layers and combine their execution into one CUDA kernel, saving lots of memory bandwidth by eliminating intermediate global memory accesses. It also performs kernel auto-tuning to tailor itself to the specific GPU devices detected, in addition to taking advantage of GPU-specific hardware optimizations such as half-precision FP16 and 8-bit integer support. All these factors make TensorRT faster at inferencing on Jetson than other solutions. With TensorRT, developers can focus on building deep learning applications and services instead of platform-dependent performance tuning. Conveniently, TensorRT is available to be deployed across many different NVIDIA GPUs, including those in the data center, PC, automotive, and embedded, so application developers only need to maintain one code base for their high-performance runtime inferencing needs. One example code base that's available and already uses TensorRT today is our two days to a demo project on GitHub, which is an end-to-end -end tutorial of the AI workflow for training and deploying deep learning for computer vision. 
It uses NVIDIA digits interactively in the cloud or PC, along with deep learning data sets available online to train example models for image recognition, object detection, and segmentation. By following the comprehensive training guides, you can recreate the pre-trained models from scratch in two days or less, or even retrain with your own custom data to get the networks to recognize objects that it didn't know before. The project is open source and includes C++ code and prototypes for loading the trained networks from digits and performing the runtime inference with TensorRT for each of the vision primitives. Two days to a demo is potentially the easiest and most straightforward way for anyone to get started training and deploying their own high-performance networks. The runtime aspect is geared for embedded applications on Jetson and includes example programs for live streaming the onboard and USB cameras. It highlights the AI workflow where you iteratively train and test network models to improve their performance over time. Here's what the network signature for object detection looks like in the code, DetectNet. It takes in a color image and outputs a list of bounded boxes of the detected objects. You can create the primitive from your own network or one of the pre-trained models from the repo. DetectNet comes with models for detecting several classes from the MS Coco dataset, including dog, chair, bottle, and airplane, in addition to several pedestrian detectors, including one for multi-class detection that can determine the locations of multiple types of objects in one pass of the network. In all, there are over 1,000 types of objects and scenes that can be recognized by the pre-trained models that come with the repo. Here's a code example of using the segmentation primitive, SegNet, which provides a dense per pixel labeling using image recognition. It's very simple to load the model and perform the processing. You either create it from a pre-trained model, the repo comes with segmentation models for urban environments, aerial scenes, and household objects, or as shown in the code from your own model. To load your own model, you just have to provide the file pass to the prototext, in this case, FCN AlexNet for segmentation, the trained snapshot weights or cafe model, and a text file containing the names of the segmentation classes in this example, ground and sky. Underneath the code calls TensorRT and CUDA for the best performance. Segmentation is particularly useful in robotics and autonomous navigation for the perception of the environment, as it can semantically label all areas of the image as being occupied or unoccupied, which is referred to as free space detection. The segment included with the repo can label up to 21 different classes per model, in addition to the sky and ground, things like buildings, roadways, other vehicles, and pedestrians. The repo comes with pre-trained segmentation models for urban environments and also aerial drones. These can be used to add intelligence to the autopilot systems to avoid collisions with dynamic obstacles and terrain. This summer at NVIDIA, we have a team of 12 high school interns doing exciting work in deep learning and robotics. On their mini humanoid transformer robot, which they outfitted with a Jetson module, Following the two days to a demo recipe, they trained their own DetectNet model to recognize and pick up garbage, starting with cups on the floor. Using the AI workflow, they were able to experiment and iteratively improve the performance of their system. Other robots the team is working on include a self-driving RC car using an end-to-end -end drive net network like from TensorCart, in addition to a LiDAR-equipped turtle bot that delivers packages around the office. These high school interns all have experience from competing in FIRST Robotics Competition, where they use AI and vision on their robots to gain an advantage over the opposing team. In the past couple of years, FIRST FRC teams from around the world have started deploying deep learning and competition with Jetson to great success. To really take AI and robotics to the next level, NVIDIA has introduced ISAAC, our enterprise-wide initiative for advancing intelligence in autonomous machines. It includes a new type of training in the cloud, using high-definition simulation with accurate physics and rendering, coupled with a complete software stack for autonomous navigation. Jetson's used to deploy ISAAC-enabled robots and example pre-integrated reference platforms are available, so anyone can easily get started developing and testing autonomous features in the field. By using simulation to train the AI, humans no longer have to manually label the training data as with supervised learning, since it's a typical bottleneck with producing the amount of data required to accurately train the networks. In Isaac Lab, a virtual architecture is set up so that the code that runs on the robot can swap out whether it's attached to the real robot or the virtual training environment. This is helpful to lower the testing overhead and makes it so that the robot operates in real life similar to how it operates in the simulator. For those of you who don't know the OpenAI Gym Project, it's a great testing ground for these advanced types of AI such as reinforcement learning and semi-supervised learning, which can exhibit much more complex and intuitive behaviors than the previously known supervised learning. 
Here's a look at the robotic reference platforms becoming available through the Isaac initiative that have the Jetson module pre-integrated for easy use. Toyota has their HSR, or Human Support Robot, in the RoboCup at Home competition aimed at personal assistance to the disabled and elderly. Teal Drone has their micro UAV that's highly integrated with Jetson and capable of more than 70 miles per hour of sustained flight. NROT Lab has their off-road ground vehicle, maritime service vessel, and industrial inspection drone in the program. There's also the MIT-inspired race car being offered by Jetson Hacks. If you don't already know Jetson Hacks, he runs a great website with lots of tutorials and tips and tricks for Jetson. Note that there are more reference platforms being added to the program in the future, and if you have a platform you'd like us to consider, please get in touch. To enable these robots with next-generation intelligence, let's take a look at reinforcement learning, a different paradigm where AI agents choose their own actions and learn from experience in their environments. Not unlike training a dog, a system of positive and negative rewards indicate to the agent how to learn and improve its performance over time. All the while, the agent is autonomously collecting experience by running hundreds and thousands of episodes in their environments. An episode is like one point in the game or match, or one attempt at completing a task. Reinforcement learning is known for exhibiting complex, intuitive behaviors that would be hard to quantify and difficult for pre-labeled, supervised systems to emulate. It's quite versatile and adept at things like dynamic motion control for grasping and picking, path planning, and locomotion. Some of you may have heard of an acronym starting to be used more in the field, AGI, or Artificial General Intelligence, machines that can learn to perform wide ranges of tasks and abilities approaching that of a human. Reinforcement learning is on the path to AGI. The same RL algorithms that master Atari and Nintendo can learn to stack objects, navigate mazes, and operate vehicles. We all still have a long way to go, but the signs are there. The latest iteration of AlphaGo was playing using reinforcement learning using an algorithm called A3C, or Asynchronous Actor Advantage Critic, which runs multiple agents in parallel to collect a lot more experience. Last year, NVIDIA Research published a paper and released the GitHub repo for GA3C, our GPU-based method for Asynchronous Actor Critic, which ramps up the scalability and performance by utilizing GPU resources. There's a lot of development and experimentation being done with focus on the algorithms and the research with parallel experience collection and replay, randomizing material properties of the environments to improve robustness, online transfer learning, and in so many other areas it can be difficult to keep up with everything. We also have a version of Two Days to a Demo geared specifically for reinforcement learning. It starts out playing in the OpenAI gym to make sure that the reinforcement algorithms are learning properly. Critically, it provides a C++ API to the reinforcement algorithms, which are commonly implemented in Python using PyTorch or TensorFlow. With the C API, it's much easier to integrate into existing robots and devices, which are predominantly based in C or ROS, the robot operating system. This two days to a demo also provides virtual scenarios for the robot to learn in simulator and gradually increase the complexity of tasks to improve the success of training the network. That brings us to the conclusion of today's presentation. In summary, thanks for joining us, and we hope you'll get involved in creating AI systems too. Later this week, be sure to download the latest Jetpack 3.1 release to take advantage of the updates for Jetson TX1 and TX2. To get started, visit our developer portal and wiki to get access to the documentation, tutorials, and developer forums. If you're affiliated with a university or institution, please apply for our EDU discount for the developer kit, which is half off and available as single units for students and multiple units for professors and faculty members. Next is time for Q&A, where I'll be taking questions from the audience. And if we don't get to your question, please feel free to post it to the Jetson forums located at the URL shown here. Okay, everyone. Uh, so if you haven't answered or asked your question yet, feel free to enter it in the chat box and uh, we'll go back through and answer some of the previously unanswered ones now. Um, so here's a question that seemed to come up a couple times during the presentation. Uh, can I run TensorFlow on Jetson, or can I do TensorFlow inferencing on Jetson? And uh, you can absolutely install TensorFlow on Jetson TX1 or TX2, and uh, Jetson Hacks has an article on it. There's a couple entries on the wiki and the form for doing that. And uh, a similar question came up as well. Uh, can TensorRT run TensorFlow inferencing graphs? And not in TensorRT2, but in the next coming version of TensorRT, TensorRT3, 
it will have a TensorFlow importing layer into it so that you can uh, train in TensorFlow or Keras and then run that inference more fast in uh, TensorRT. And uh, that will be available in the next version of T TensorRT, uh, TensorRT3, um, which should be out uh, later this year and is uh, already announced on the website if you go to developer.nvidia.com slash TensorRT. Uh, there's this another kind of similar question, which can I install ROS for Jetson, and does Jetson support ROS 2.0? And uh, the answer to that as well is yes. There are install guides on the wiki and Jetson hacks for ROS, both on TX1 and TX2. And uh, also we have an official support in place with OSRF who maintain ROS, and uh, they make it so that they build all the ROS binaries in advance for Jetson. And so all you have to do to install ROS on Jetson is to install from the normal ROS repo and not have to build it completely from source, which is a, a pretty nice feature. Uh, let's look for another question here. Oh, here's a good one. When can I download Jetpack 3.1? Uh, so it'll be available early next week, Monday or Tuesday. So check back. And we'll also have blog posts and such out with more detailed performance info. So yeah, early next week, check back at the that same URL, developer.nvidia.com slash Jetpack. And it'll be posted there for download. Anybody can download it and install it. Um, there was a a question about can I run Jetpack from within Docker? And uh, the answer to that is technically you probably could try to, but it's only officially supported to run Jetpack from an Ubuntu 14.04 native install on an x86 machine and not from with a virtual machine or within Docker. Understandably, that can be inconvenient if you don't actually have a native Ubuntu install, but it is highly recommended for stability reasons since when you're flashing the Jetson, it transfers large amount of data over USB. And uh, there are some threads in the forum about increasing the USB buffer sizes in Docker and virtual machines. So you might get it to work. But uh, for most reliability, you know, it's preferred to run Jetpack from a native Ubuntu install itself. Uh, next question, does Jetson TX2 have an IMU or inertial measurement unit on board? And uh, the answer to that is no, not on the module itself, but there are a, a couple different miniature carriers and peripherals from the ecosystem, such as the Ovidia J120 board, which integrates IMU onto the board itself. And uh, that makes it, it was, I think it's a SPI or I squared C IMU, so it can be self-contained right there on the compact subassembly. And uh, here's another question. How do you switch the power modes for Jetson TX2 between max Q and max P that we asked about? And um, there's two utilities that come uh, installed on board the Jetson. There's the Jetson clock script, which uses the Linux SysFS to go in and tweak all the different clock settings and such. Uh, but there's also this new NVP model tool, which Jetson Hacks did a post about. And that can be used to set up all of these different settings because there's, uh, as mentioned in the presentation, there's CPU clocks, GPU clocks, EMC clocks, PCI Express, all the different endpoints have their own clocks. And you can really go in granularly and tweak them all. But the NVP model allows you to assimilate a profile of all of those different ones and uh, switch between them seamlessly. Uh, there is a question here about faster RCNN and YOLO in TensorRT2 and uh, pertaining to the custom layers and if the users need to implement those custom layers. And the answer is that uh, NVIDIA has already provided those custom layers required to do YOLO and faster RCNN in TensorRT2. They come as samples included in TensorRT2. So you shouldn't have to do anything to get those working. But in theory, if there was a new YOLO or new faster RCNN that came out with additional layers that weren't supported, you could port those new unsupported layers to TensorRT uh, with the addition of this plugin API. So in the future, it should be much less of an issue if these new detection frameworks and whatnot come out that use layers that aren't actually in the uh, you know, formal 
Tensor RT support. But uh, out of the box, we did use YOLO and faster RCNN uh, to uh, get people started. Uh, there is a question. Is OpenCV for Tegra based on OpenCV2 or OpenCV3? And currently, the pre-built OpenCV for Tegra from NVIDIA is based on uh, OpenCV2, uh, 2.4, actually. But you can very easily install OpenCV3 from source. In fact, it's mostly the same uh, at this point. In fact, uh, NVIDIA's roadmap for OpenCV for Tegra has basically been to upstream all of our proprietary Neon, SIMD, and CUDA uh, optimizations. Um, so at this point, it's basically um, the same version uh, between OpenCV for Tegra binary and the upstream code. So you don't really lose anything by just pulling it upstream and compiling it. So uh, no worries to actually recompile it from OpenCV if you need uh, new features in that, like facial recognition detectors and whatnot. Um, let's see. So here's a question about the Isaac simulator and does it work with ROS robot definitions? And uh, we are adding a ROS uh, intercommunication uh, layer so that it can um, parse URDF and the different uh, formats that ROS normally works with. So it can very easily be integrated with existing ROS robots. And uh, that is to say that Isaac should be uh, pretty much drop in uh, to ROS uh, existing robots so that it's easy as possible to train those. Um, here's a question. Are standard six-axis industrial robots made by KUKA or ABB also available? Uh, I would say to inquire with those particular vendors, but um, in the case of some such as FANUC that we've announced partnerships with in the past, um, in the future, you should be able to get those standard industrial arms with Jetson and NVIDIA GPUs pre-integrated with them. And that's kind of like the actual industrial uh, deployment solution for that. Um, here's a question. Can you show a sample data set for image segmentation? And uh, we include a number of these data sets in the two days to a demo under the segmentation section, including um, cityscapes, which is a driving segmentation that's very good. And uh, also, we made our own aerial segmentation data set for people who are doing UAV development. Um, and there's other ones as well. We have a thread on the forum, which links to a bunch of different data sets that you can try to get started. But generally, cityscapes and this aerial segmentation data set are the biggest ones. Um, and also the Pascal VOC data set we use to do household objects and such. Um, let's see here. Uh, here's a good question about the EDU discount. Um, if I got the EDU discount for TX1, can I also get the EDU discount for TX2? And the answer to that is yes. Um, everybody is eligible. All students are eligible for both the TX1 and TX2 discounts. And uh, professors and faculty member uh, can apply for however many units of each that they would like. Uh, here's uh, another question. Let's scroll back to the top here. Uh, what's the best way to collect data for indoor navigation? And I would say normally it's to collect it on the reference platform itself instead of uh, walking around with a different rig or whatnot. But generally, these robots have both a human-controlled mode and a autonomous mode or learning mode. And uh, for example, with the interns, when they were training their RC car to drive around indoors, they operated it by joystick for an hour or two and collected all the LiDAR and video data. And you can easily do that through GStreamer or just writing a simple program that dumps things to files. And uh, after an hour or two of collecting data, they trained their network, and then the car was able to drive on its own. But it's this AI workflow where you iteratively collect and train more data. Um, so as easy as possible uh, that you can set that up, it will uh, you know, be beneficial into the future uh, so that you can easily collect more data and then keep making your network better. Uh, here's a good question about the Denver 
uh, CPUs. The question was, in TX2, what are those two Denver 64-bit CPUs in addition to the quad-core A57, and are they just yet another CPU in Linux? And uh, the answer to that is yes, they do just show up as uh, two additional cores. When the Jetson TX2 boots up, the uh, performance profile that it's in, those cores will be offline. So if you use the Tegra stats or top uh, to view your system performance, you will only see four cores actually being used. But if you use NVV model or Jetson, uh, Jetson clock script, it will actually turn all six on so that you can uh, very easily um, actually utilize all of them. And what's different about the Denver cores is that they're more uh, x86-like, let's say, for lack of a better term, uh, more for high-end, single-threaded performance, as opposed to the A57s are uh, really geared for multi-threading and uh, lower-end mobile applications. But if you have CPU-intensive applications, for example, the reinforcement learning is really good because uh, some parts of reinforcement learning are still on CPU, like the solver and whatnot, where the gradients are actually used to compute the, uh, the additions to the network to make it learn with backpropagation. That solver still runs on CPU, and it's good to run those solvers on the Denver cores because they're more server-like, quote-unquote. Uh, next question here. Are you planning to integrate any FPGA into Jetson? Uh, the answer to that is no, but NVIDIA has announced these new uh, DLAs, Deep Learning Accelerator, at GTC earlier this spring, and uh, it was also previously announced that those will be included in the, the next version of Tegra, Xavier. Um, so there will be some uh, solid-state neural network inferencing architecture integrated into future uh, Tegra chips that further accelerate DNN inferencing for, you know, more simpler uh, architectures that you would see in the supervised domain, like Google Net or ResNet that aren't very dynamic or adaptive. And that frees up the, you know, much larger and more capable GPU for doing the next generation networks like reinforcement learning and whatnot. Uh, here's a question. Can I use segmentation on Jetson TX2? And, uh, it's a good question because segmentation is normally known for being very uh, high-end and computationally demanding. Other embedded platforms would uh, struggle to run it at even half a frame per second. But with Tensor RT, uh, you're able to run it you know, up to 10 or 15 hertz, even with the HD Cityscapes um, models, which are 1024 by 1024 or 2048 by 2048 input. So the segmentation input is generally pretty high resolution, and it takes a lot of computational horsepower to do it. And Jetson TX1 and TX2 are uh, one of the very few embedded platforms that you can actually deploy segmentation into the real world. And that's a great capability to have because segmentation is very useful for identifying you know, where in the environment you can go as opposed to DetectNet is used a lot for detecting individual objects, not to say every object in the environment that you might want to label. Uh, here's a question. Are we limited to AlexNet and GoogleNet? And uh, even though those are the two common networks that are referenced and used in the two days to a demo, you're absolutely not limited to AlexNet and GoogleNet you can actually supply your own proto text to the two days to a demo. If you go into the header for the ImageNet class, you can specify the file path to the proto text and also the name of the blob for like the input blob and the output blob. So some networks might have different names for their inputs and their outputs. So you can specify all that and uh, as long as your network abides by that signature quote-unquote, many of which do, like ResNet and whatnot, uh, you can easily experiment and swap them all out. AlexNet and GoogleNet are just used as examples. Uh, here's a question about how do you obtain uh, TX1 and TX2. That's a good question because worldwide there's a pretty complex distribution in some regions. But what I recommend is going to uh, the NVIDIA region locator. So if you just go to developer.nvidia.com slash embedded and uh, go into the dev kit section. There'll be all these different regions that you can click through and either 
find uh, the NVIDIA.com web store, which is typically where you would buy it if you're doing the EDU discount, or it'll point you to a distributor in your region. And uh, the modules, you can get through the distributors. The dev kit, you can get through distributors or uh, the NVIDIA.com web store. Um, here's a good question about uh, integrating with robotics. Uh, how are motor controllers commonly connected to the Jetson TX2? And uh, Jetson does have a few PWM outputs itself that you could connect a PWM connection directly to. But otherwise, uh, there's SPI or I squared C converters that are typically used, or even you can use like a USB device. Typically, I just throw one of those from Pululu in. They're like a simple motor controller, and you can just hook it up via USB, and it might have 20 channels of PWM, and it runs the USB driver on the Jetson. And although it requires a small external board, um, you know, it can be very convenient to use. There are also carriers in the ecosystem that integrate PWM controllers onto those. So you can find uh, the list of ecosystem products on the wiki or on the, the Jetson portal and uh, some of those have additional motor controllers. But generally, uh, for like drones and things that require more than just a couple channels of PWM, since Jetson only has uh, four channels, that uh, you might need an expansion board of some type, either on the carrier or an external adapter. Um, okay, let me uh, scroll and find. Uh, here's a, a question about the Z camera, which was pictured on the ecosystem slide there and is uh, pretty popularly used in the Jetson community. And uh, there was a question about using the Z camera from Ross and OpenCV for Tegra. And uh, there are ROS node available from Stereo Labs that you can use to run on the Jetson that will import the, the Z camera into ROS using their Z SDK API. And uh, also you can use the OpenCV CV Capture API, either through video for Linux 2, um, to gain access to the actual stereo data. Uh, there's a bunch of questions about when you can view the webinar on demand and when uh, the slides will be available for download. Uh, everybody should receive another email with the link to the on demand. And uh, also, I responded to a question to everybody earlier with a link to the uh, slides that they can get. It's github.com slash dustdnv slash jetson dash presentations. And, uh, you can just go to my GitHub profile and find it there. Uh, I just posted them earlier, the PDF anyways, um, so that anybody can download them. Um, here's a question about um, if you can connect a discrete GPU to Jetson. That is not currently supported uh, because the uh, Jetson driver model uh, doesn't work over PCI Express on Jetson the GPU is integrated and it just uses all user space drivers. So there's actually not a PCI Express GPU driver for Jetson currently, but uh, in the next generation Xavier, uh, that will support uh, discrete GPU connectivity as well. Um, uh, here's a question, where can I find benchmarks for object recognition for the latest Jetpack? Uh, in a few days, early next week, uh, there will be a Parallel for All blog posted that you can find the latest results, uh, including GoogleNet and ResNet recognition per performance that compare TensorRT to previous solutions. And as mentioned in the webinar, um, it results in 2x performance, which is a nice little boost um, for uh, you know just a free software update. Uh, here's a good question. Is there a TX1, TX2 program available for AI startups? And uh, we didn't cover this in the webinar, but there is an NVIDIA program called Inception, NVIDIA Inception, that uh, is an AI startup incubator. And it's not dissimilar from the EDU program, just geared up for startups that are working in robotics and AI. So uh, if that applies to you, Google NVIDIA Inception and you can apply through the form there. And there's a bunch of benefits uh, in addition to, you know, working with the Jetson team and whatnot. You can uh, get uh, early access to, you know, the roadmap and things like that. Uh, there was a question about when will Isaac be available. Uh, it's available to select researchers currently in basically in beta testing. 
uh, to iron everything out, but it's planned to be available generally later this year, and uh, that should be a nice boost up, because currently I use the Gazebo simulator, which is lower fidelity that you can see in the Jetson reinforcement repo, but uh, when Isaac comes out, that should give us a real big boost in intelligence, because the fidelity of the graphics and physics is much better in Unreal Engine 4 as opposed to uh, uh, other open source uh, engines and, and whatnot. Um, here's a question about hardware virtualization on the jet. And is it possible to run two OSs simultaneously? Um, the answer to this is complicated because technically it is possible. There are the ARM A57 virtualization extensions, and NVIDIA provides the uh, technical reference manual for the TX1 and TX2 chips. So you could go in and code your own totally custom OS or hypervisor to do that. Uh, but the sample root OS that ships with Jetson and Jetpack, Ubuntu, uh, does, unfortunately does not support that type of virtualization. But that's not to say that with some work from the community, you can get it to work. Or I've seen people try to get Zen and other hypervisors try to work too. Um, uh, here's a question. For somebody just getting started, what do you recommend to come up to speed the fastest? First, I would visit the wiki, elinux.org slash Jetson. That tells you basically everything you need to know about Jetson in one page. And then um, also I would uh, visit the two days to a demo, and uh, that will get you started on AI as well. Um, here's a question about Isaac. Will Isaac use NVIDIA physics underneath? The uh, answer to that is yes, there will be multiple physics engines uh, available underneath Isaac, and physics will be one of them. And also physics has been upgraded with a bunch of new features and solvers to make it more applicable to you know these really low-level types of gripping that require uh, really high-depth simulation for, uh, you know, that type of thing. Uh, here's a question. Is Jetson inference two days to a demo for TX2 only, or can it be run on PC? Uh, as it is given, it's made to run and compile on Jetson, but the, if you look in the Issues tab, there are people that have got it running on PC with some very minor changes that maybe we would uh, integrate into the future. Uh, so we have a time for just another question or two, and then uh, Lon will wrap us up. But uh, let me uh, find another question or two that we can wrap up with. And if we don't get your question, please join us on the forums at devtalk.nvidia.com afterwards. And uh, you can find me there, and we can continue the discussion there. So uh, is there CAN bus available on TX2? And uh, the answer to that is yes, there is integrated CAN bus controller in TX2 uh, with the driver available um, that uh, is open source as well. So you can do CAN bus and integrate it into different types of uh, robots and whatnot. And uh, let me find a final question for us to end on before we move it over to the forum here. Um, Can you run SLAM algorithms on the Jetson? That's a good question. And uh, absolutely, you can do SLAM and point cloud processing. The point cloud library, PCL, actually has a CUDA backend. Um, so uh, you can compile that on the Jetson and run it, which uh, comes with different SLAM implementations like iterative closest point and uh, other SLAM implementations. Also, there's ROS available, which comes with a bunch of different SLAM that I've seen people run in the community, such as RTAB map. And there's a lot of different SLAMs on GitHub that you can try to run. And a lot of them are even GPU accelerated underneath. So uh, the answer to that is yes. Uh, unfortunately, that is about all the time that we have for questions in the live session today. Um, but if uh, you have something that we didn't get to, please join us on the forum, and uh, we'll reconvene there. Thanks a lot for joining us. Thanks, Dusty, and thanks, every, everyone, for tuning in to this webinar. Uh, as Dusty said, the slides and recording will be available later today. If you come back to this same um, 
URL that you use to log in. You should be able to view the recording uh, later today. Uh, we'll also be sending out an email on when Jetpack will be available for download, so keep an eye out uh, for that as well. And then join us on the forum uh, to uh, continue the conversation. We had lots of fantastic questions, and so we're really excited to keep you guys engaged and, and get all of those answered. So uh, don't forget to check out the resource list. It's got a lot of great information on that. And have a great day, guys. Thanks.